I'll start by wishing you all welcome to this panel on the aesthetics of exemplarity. This is the first of our two sessions. The next one will be tomorrow, same time. Um, I'm Anne Eriksen, as many of you know, from the University of Oslo uh, in Norway. Uh, and I'm going to share this session today. We have, uh, regrettably, no, not regrettably, we have three papers today. We should have had four, that's the regret. Doreen Noyes has uh, become ill, so she sent her, her apologies, but she had to cancel. Uh, we will um, have the three papers today in the order that is also on the, the website, which means that we will start with Ina Stonet, go on to Kelly Kornbach, and finish with Ante Lindfors. Um, and we will, due to Dory not being here, we will have some more time for questions and discussions and so on. Um, but hopefully we will nonetheless stick to the time that we have been asked to, to fill, about 15 minutes for each paper. Uh, so then we just start. Uh, I'll start by introducing Ina Stolnit, who holds a PhD in cultural history from the University of Oslo, where she is also teaching. Uh, and her paper today, which draws on her PhD thesis, has the title Densified Moments Royal, Royal Exemplarity Through the Lens of the Tableau. So please, Ina. Thank you. Um, I will first share the screen. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Um, this paper, um, Densified Moments, Royal Exemplarity Through the Lens of the Tableau, like Anna just said, is based on my thesis. And it um, explores the communicative strategy in a series of historical paintings from the end of the 18th century in Denmark, Norway. The historical series present vivid examples that celebrate the rule of the Oldenburg dynasty. To convey these moral messages, the artist used a communicational strategy widely known in the latter part of the 18th century called the tableau. And in this presentation, I will discuss how these tableaus invite the viewer to emulation and how this communicative strategy was meant to strengthen the rule of the Oldenburg dynasty. I will discuss one of the paintings more closely to show you how both the narratives themselves and the communicative devices were reshaped by new audiences and new social needs. The historical series in the Great Hall at Christiansburg Castle in Copenhagen was planned during a turbulent period in the Kingdom of Denmark, Norway. The King Christian VII was mentally ill, and this created a vacuum of power. And several politicians, artists, and historians were involved in planning this historical program. The goal of the series was to strengthen the political foundation of the monarchy through the construction of moral examples in this period of crisis. If I talk too fast, uh, don't uh, worry, just tell me and I will <laughs> slow down, okay? The artist who was given the commission was the Danish history painter, Nikolai Abelgård, and he spent 13 years painting from 1778 to 91. Through 10 large canvases, this series of paintings presents the virtues and good deeds of the Oldenburg dynasty from Christian I in the 15th century to the contemporary King Christian VII. And they present a condensed moment or example in the reign of each king. The Oldenburg dynasty is celebrated for its effort to protect the kingdom, create peace and welfare, and the rise of science and culture. They are presented as the ultimate citizens. Their good actions are motivated by their bravery, 
public spirit and their faith in God. The series also tells the story of many other men. The kings are surrounded by famous men from their regime who are also honored for their high moral and good actions. Each painting presents moral examples of social conduct through moral lessons in patriotism, public spirit, and faithfulness to the king. The two last paintings are presented as a culmination of all the good actions of the previous kings. During the reign of Frederick V and his son Christian VII, peace and prosperity is presented as reaching its peak. The historical events and examples shown in the paintings correspond with the stories in the history books written by the historians Peter Fredrik Sum and Uwe Molling, written in the same period. These history books were widely read by the public and were written as history school books for the Latin school. The moral histories in the paintings were therefore comprehensible and meant to reach out to a wide audience in the period. Abilgård used the tableau in two different ways. In some paintings, he created an exalted atmosphere with compositions where the king and his men interact with allegorical figures and personifications. Other paintings can be characterized as more mundane or down to earth, where he created a more realistic illusion of a historical moment. As moral tab tableaus, however, all of the paintings present the viewer with constructed moments that are densified, containing both the past and the future. These condensed moments where the spectator could capture everything at a glance was meant to increase and focus the effect of the example. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail and discuss the whole series in this presentation. Therefore, I, we will look a bit closer at one of them. This painting of Christian V presents the king writing the Danish law in, of 1683. It had a very central position in this grand historical program. It was placed in the very center of the room next to a painting of his father, Frederick III, the first king receiving the right to rule as a sovereign monarch in Denmark, Norway. What is striking with this painting is the mundane and down-to-earth atmosphere. It, enhan it enhances the king's role as a political leader and not his divine power. He is presented more in a businessman-like manner where he's seated around a table collaborating with his men. The men seated around the table together with the king can all be identified and represent members of the King's Privy Council in 1683. At first sight, the viewer gets the impression of being an eyewitness to this event. The figures are wearing historical costumes and wigs presented in an intimate Baroque interior. It's like we're looking through a window observing the moment the law was completed. But seen as a tableau, the painting encapsulates something more than a realistic presentation of a single moment in time. The painting actually shows a much more comprehensive story where time must be understood as something rather secondary. Tableau means painting in French, but also had a wider meaning in the second half of the 18th century. Previous research has examined various aspects of the tableau and characterizes it as a type of aesthetics or a particular mode of representation or representational technology. It was used in titles within topography, antiquarian representations, natural history, economics and medicine, and political and intellectual history. Semantically, the concept of the tableau has close connections to tables. Both the word table and tableau concerns visually synthesizing representational media that makes it easier to see everything at a glance. The tableau was an effective and useful way to present general knowledge and moral lessons in a comprehensible way. It creates a synopsis from which the viewer was meant to draw moral lessons. In a painting, it does this through the, the gestures of the figures their body language and expressions, 
and other small concrete and telling details. It constructs a frozen moment, a moment that is charged with meaning. It may contain both the past and the future. The way the tableau constructs a moment actually has two meanings. First of all, the tableau could compress an extended period of time into a single moment. In a painting, this means that people who had not actually been present at the same time or in the same place could be represented together because they had significance for the same event. Secondly, the tableau made it possible for the spectator to get information about complex events and conditions at a single glance, almost as if one is actually present. The function of the tableau thus involves both representation and perception. For this communication to work, the recipients had to have a certain competence. They had to be able to decode the message. This form was widely known in the higher social circles in the 18th century. So the competence required to read a tableau, whether it was a theatrical production, a painting, or a literary tableau was also widespread. This communicative strategy and demand for instantiousness and intelligibility should be seen in connection with the intended audience. As a representational tool, the tableau must be seen in the context of the emergence of a number of genres with a new focus on everyday life and actuality of events. Within the classical Magister Vita tradition, historical examples were intended to inspire young men of the elite to meet the tasks of public life. According to intellectual historian Mark Salber Phillips, this tradition in the late 18th century was replaced by a more emotional and inner version of the idea of history as the teacher of life. Phillips points out how the growing middle class constituted a large new group within the reading public in this period. This new reading audience had a greater interest in social and inner aspects of life, and this influenced the use of examples and the didactic role of history in many different genres. The new commercial society created new boundaries between the public and private spheres, and identification and empathy became an important part of storytelling. I believe the communicational device of the tableau should be seen in connection with these changes in exemplarity, as pointed out by Phillips. It met the needs of a wider audience. So what is the densified moment in this painting. The painting places the Danish law as an important fundament for absolute state, and it honors the king for creating a fair and just kingdom based on these laws. The law wasn't just written in 1683, however, it actually took 22 years to complete it. Through the lens of the tableau, the man in the background stands out as a key figure. The tableau communicates through clear gestures and expressions, and he clearly has an underlying message to the viewer. He is placed behind the others and is the only one looking straight up at us, drawing us into the scene. The German art expert Friedrich Ramdor described the painting in 1792 and identified the man in the background as. Peder Griffenfeld. Griffenfeld was Christian V's close advisor and the de facto ruler of the kingdom for several years. Previous research has dismissed Ramdor's, Ramdor's description since Griffenfeld was in prison in 1683 and he couldn't possibly have been present when the law was completed. Griffenfeld fell into disgrace seven years before the completion of the law when he was accused of treason and he spent the rest of his life in prison. But looking more closely at the context and the period when this painting was made, a lot had changed. A massive effort was now being made by historians and artists to restore his reputation and clear his name. Since he is such an essential part of the densified moment in this painting, we will look a bit closer at his background. Griffenfeld was born Peder Schumacher. He was the son of a wine merchant, and he had worked his way up to his high office. Following the introduction of absolutism in 1660, Griffenfeld wrote the Danish royal law, the Lex Regia, in 1665. This law formed the basis for the constitution of the absolute monarchy. A part of 
apart from the king, Griffenfeld stands out as the most important man in the painting. It not only restores his reputation, it also honors him by presenting him as an exemplary citizen. The artist thus seeks to instill a thought in the bourgeoisie viewer to see themselves as an integral part of the absolutist state. This was an important political strategy of the monarchy in this time of instability and a strategy for revitalizing the absolutist regime. As a tableau, the painting communicates this moral message through many small important details. Like I mentioned before, he's standing symbolically behind the king and the others, and he's holding a book or a manuscript in his hand that represent the Lex Regia. He's also placed next to a cabinet with various books that refer to the initiary work and the previous laws on which the Danish law was based. His background as a member of the bourgeoisie is clear since he is not dressed in the manner of a nobleman, but is wearing a simple gray jacket. He also carries the white ribbon showing us the order of the Dannebrog. In 1671, Griffenfeld initiated a new rank regulation that allowed normal citizens to be ennobled and created this new chivalry order. The order of the Dannebrog was given as a reward for faithful service to the king. Griffenfeld was himself the first citizen to be ennobled and the first to receive the order. As a representational mode, the tableau processed and reified specific and concrete details into a more general and moral message. In this painting, it was used to strengthen and revitalize the political foundations of the monarchy. Griffenfeld, a former member of the bourgeoisie, is a crucial part of the condensed moment in this central tableau in the Great Hall. He is presented as an example of the new possibilities the bourgeoisie had gained in the absolute state through hard work and loyalty to the king. To increase the impact of the example, Abelgård has constructed an idea of a moment in history in order to create a feeling of immediacy and presence in the viewer. Abelgård uses the contrast of light and darkness to create a chiaroscuro effect, a way to intensify the message and create pictorial unity. The tableau created a new form of meaning since it does something with the ideal and the example that is presented. One is not only presented with a good example or a moral, the tableau was meant to evoke a more moral feeling in the spectator. To interpret the tableau, both emotions, reasons and imagination had to be set in motion. Through more naturalistic and sentimental communication, the tableau met the needs of a wider audience and enabled an immediate moral identification with the beholder. This vivid and visual representational mode was meant to intensify the viewer's sense of presence and create a deeper emotional engagement with the example. Thank you. Should I stop to share? <laughs> Okay. Yes, we should, so we better can see each, each other. Yep. Thank you, Ina. Um, then we have time for questions and comments and, and so on. You may either use the raise hand function or uh, or a chat. Any questions or comments? No? While you're thinking, um, I have a comment. I think it's more a comment than a question. Uh, I think it's really very interesting, this, this temporal, temporal or perhaps non-temporal aspect of the tableau. Uh, because when one, say, uh, one says history painting or history, um, that, per definition, implies something about time, temporality, duration of a time, and so on, uh, which means that, well, one tends nearly automatically to think that historical painting has something to do with time. 
Uh, and of course, these paintings are from the past. They were from the past when they were new, they are even more from the past now. Uh, but nonetheless, they are, as you explained uh, by the use of the tableau, uh, from a very condensed past that is united into this, uh, this tableau. Uh, when the temporal span, 20 years that this law work took, uh, the years that uh, Griffinwald spent in prison and so on uh, is just not there. Um, so, well, perhaps I'll try to end this with a question of some kind. I just want to know more, actually. Um, is the temporal dimension of history completely effaced and has it disappeared totally? Or is time present in the tableau in some other ways? or some other modes than what we usually think of today when we speak about history. Do you have any ideas about that? Um, I think it's present more as a condensed moment, you know, like um, it's, it's loaded or it's, um, it's charged with meaning, you know, so it's um, crystallized in some way. I don't know uh, the right word. It's it's um, like a um, re relief. <laughs> it it becomes very meaningful, you know. Everything is is condensed and um, concentrated somehow. Um, but in these uh, more realistic presentations, he has created these illusions of a moment. So at first sight, especially through a modern um, through modern glasses. This looks like a realistic painting. It's hard for us to uh, think in the same manner as the artist did or the audience in the period. So it looks like a moment, but it's it's just a construction. <laughs> so, and in the allegorical figure um, paintings, he has more created. Um, the allegories are more uh, a part of the moment that he has constructed. They have become more alive than the um, classical allegories, allegorical figures. Um, they are more moved by uh, the situation they are a part of somehow. And also this, this creates more feelings, more empathy, um, a way to that the examples should, should uh, yeah, have a stronger effect, emotional mm -hmm. effect. I don't know if that answered your, your question. No. <laughs> um, it was a good answer, <laughs> anyhow. Uh, now we have three persons who want to say something. Antti, Baldo, and Susan. Uh, Antti first, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Very, very illuminating. You mentioned that the interpretive or the decoding practices were quite widespread during those times, so that um, lay people basically knew how to interpret these tableaus, and these tableaus had a didactic and moral function. So I was wondering if we, do we have any evidence that in, with regard how successful were these tableaus in, in serving such moral functions, and like how did the lay people react to these? Um, thank you. Uh, it there is some uh, descriptions from uh, the audience um, that visited the Grand Hall and their reactions are described. So from the art expert Friedrich Iramdoel and also other, um, he was a nobility himself, so he was quite um, educated. <laughs> uh, but we have examples of um, members from the bourgeoisie, uh, of course, also educated people that uh, have positive reactions and negative reactions to the paintings. And this also is a part of my interpretation. Um, but unfortunately, the whole uh, castle and the grand hall burned down um, just some years after he was finished to paint. And only three of the first paintings were um, saved. <laughs> so the rest of the, um, all the other paintings and the example I have shown you uh, is actually a sketch. Uh, oil sketch, so um, it's it's a bit lost. The, the effect that it should have had, we can't really say that much about it because it lived for such a long, such a short period. 
of time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. My bill. Uh, thank you very much. Um, partly, partly you answered my question because um, when you said that the castle well, went away in the flames and, and only three paintings are left, because I was wondering as a sort of, um, it's a bit beside your point, I think, but if when, when you say that lay people knew how to interpret, as Auntie said, what about the long-term reception? Do you have any ideas of when the competence in interpreting sort of is dwindling? Sort of in the in the whole lifetime of a painting, when do people cease to understand what kind of statement it is? Um, that's a hard hard question. <laughs> it's it's an impossible yeah. one. You can refrain. I, yeah, I, it's impossible to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that as long as um, uh, these examples that uh, the, the paintings show us, they are very famous. Um, if you know Denmark's history, you will recognize something. Also for the modern viewer, you will you will recognize something in these paintings. Um, but of course, all the details and uh, Griffenfeld, for example, he's not famous today. <laughs> so the knowledge is lost um, and it took a lot of digging and a lot of time and a lot of reading around the context to actually understand what what it shows so um yeah it, it when it happens it's uh, that's really interesting and <laughs> really hard to answer <laughs> i guess also when when people stop to read uh, zoom and mulling and these history books that were really written in the same period um when they kind of disappeared from the from the schools and from you know um, that generation I think that yeah somehow the paintings were more and they became became more mysterious with time definitely I can add just one thing that um, in the enormous church at uh, Uppsala in Sweden there is a um, well a tomb for uh, Gustav Vasa the first king who united uh, the Swedish uh, kingdom. And uh, when I go there next time, I will take a look at the pictures around his um, his tomb with your paper in, in mind, because I think I will uh, detect something new in them. Thank you very much. That sounds interesting. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Susanne, please. Yes. Thank you very much for this extremely interesting and, and very, very elegant presentation. And I, I have to apologize now because we have a, a really violent thunderstorm in Helsinki at the moment. So I had some glitches in the sound. Mm -hmm. So I, if this is something you already addressed, I, I, I apologize. But I, I was reminded of these, uh, the medieval mystery plays where they, of course, often use this kind of tableaus to convey rather complex narratives and, and stories. So I was, I was wondering a bit about the uh, sort of intertextuality of, of this particular genre of painting. Um, it was, was that at all something that, that came into it? That sort of like narratives from, from written sources or sort of well-known stories that were uh, conveyed and, and understood through, through this. Yeah, um, thank you, <laughs> definitely. Um, I read um, Ludwig Holberg, Peter Fredrik Psum, and that I mentioned, and Uwe Malling, and also um, um, Memory Park. Uh, what is the name in English? <laughs> At Jägers Pris, it's a, a memory park with statues, uh, where a lot of the men surrounding the king um, are the men surrounding the kings in the painting. And these were also project a project initiated at the same time. So all these different sources were really crucial to uh, get to know, to understand the paintings. Because when I sat down and just looked at the paintings, they, I didn't understand nothing. <laughs> it, they were all, it was impossible for a modern viewer to, to get real meaning. It, it was all shallow, like just looking at the title, it seems like it's nothing more there, you know? 
uh, with, with reading the context, this, it, this grew. And um, it was amazing how, how much information that is put into each painting. Abigor really was well read and um, he had a huge library and um, a lot of used a lot of sources and he has had a lot of people surrounding him giving him advices so um, there were a lot of intention <laughs> into all the details um, and uh, yeah um, necessary that I, it was necessary that I read different went to different places um, so this was a part of the time, you know, in um, in different ways, these stories existed uh, in uh, surrounded people in different ways, and that's why they had such a huge impact um, on the audience. Oh. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, no more, no more raised hands. Uh, and time is running, so I think we will say thank you, Ina, and you. go on to the next uh, presentation by Kille Karndok, uh, Professor of Cultural Studies at the University of Bergen. He is going to speak on Greta Thunberg as forebuilt, the politics, aesthetics, and the rhetoric of the child. I don't know, Kille, how you're going to speak, manage all that in 15 minutes, but the floor is yours. No, thank you. I don't know either, but um, um, I didn't think about the time when I was writing the abstract, but uh, I realized that I speak really slow. So uh, the 15-minute presentation is very, very brief. I just have to start. Do everybody see my screen? Yes. moment. When 15-year-old Greta Thunberg started her school strike in August 2018, she did not only have a placard saying school strike for the climate, she also brought a leaflet explaining the strike. And this leaflet said, we children don't usually do what you tell us to do. We do what you do. And since you adults don't give a shit about my future, I won't either. My name is Greta, and I'm in ninth grade. And I'm school striking for the climate until the election day. In this way, she presented herself as a child, and she has continued to do so in the speeches and her public appearances, at least the, for the following year. She has also been publicly perceived as a child. We could consider her a cultural hero or what is termed a forebuilt in German and the Scandinavian languages. Such cultural heroes generate stories and are embedded in stories. In Inbedic's case, all these stories are about the child. She has been portrayed as a child in a number of books, for the most part children's books, and has been associated with Pippa Longstocking, the eternal nine-year-old from Otri Lindgren's universe. To be a child is not something that usually gives authority in public debates, but this seems not to be the case in climate change discourse. And in this paper, I will discuss what kind of significance the trope of the child might have for her position as a forebuilt. A forebuilt is, according to Dorothy Norris, a person that stands forward to be imitated. Thus, it is as much a performative practice as it is a social status. Regarded as a performative practice, the Forbuilt is shaped in the interplay between the performer, the message, and the response of the audience. Its success depends on imitation, evaluation, and transmission of certain kinds of performances. This implies that the act of the forbuilt must not only represent something new. 
It must also have to resonate with the interests, norms, and values of the audience. Thus, its success evolves in the tension between innovation and tradition, between the exceptional and the representative. Torbilt is a particular kind of modeling example characterized by embodiment and performativity. Yet, modeling examples do not necessarily have to be performed and embodied. They might just as well be narrated. And in rhetoric, it's common to make a distinction between modeling examples and serial examples. That is the one representing the many. Anne Eriksen and her colleagues have pointed out that the modeling and serial, serial example might be regarded at, as aspects of exemplarity rather than different, distinctly different kinds of examples. Furthermore, the narrated and rhetorical example might also be entangled with performances. And in her exemplarity, does not just depend on her performances, but also on the narratives about her, and not to forget her own narratives. And in this paper, I regard exemplarity both as a certain kind of performative practice that invites for imitation, and as a discursive practice. And my main focus will be on her speeches from 2018 and 2019. 19, for the most part, the speech is printed in this book. No one is too small to make a difference. First, a little bit about how Thunberg connects climate change to her personal life. There is almost a self-evident relationship between the future and children, expressed through sayings like, the children are the future. And Thunberg uses this naturalized futurity of the child as a rhetorical resource. For instance, in this quote from her TED talk from 2018, it says, if I live to be 100, I will be alive in the year 2103. When I think about the future you today, you don't think beyond the year 2050, but then, I will, in the best case, not even have lived half of my life. What happens next? The year 2078, I will celebrate my 75th birthday. If I have children or grandchildren, maybe they will spend the day with me. Maybe they will ask me about you, the people who were around back in 2018. Maybe they'll ask why you didn't do anything while there still was time to act. What we do or don't do right now will affect my entire life and the lives of my children and grandchildren. What we do or don't do right now, me and my generation can't undo in the future. In this quote, she uses the simple fact that children will grow up to relate climate science and politics to a personal life. She does so by combining three levels of time. First, measurable linear time according to climate politics and climate modeling. The Paris Agreement aims for a climate neutral world within 2050, and 2100 is when most climate prognoses end. Second, the lifespan. She has adapted the year 2100 to a lifespan as the year she turns 100 in 2103. And third, family cycles. She embeds a lifespan in what so <coughs> social historian Tamara Harriman has termed family time. According to Harriman, family time has the capability of transcending individual life experiences as the time on grandparents, parents, children, and grandchildren. It has the ability to mediate between individual time and historical time. It makes historical processes imaginable and tellable while it at the same time connects personal experiences to historical changes. And this is also how family time works in this quote. To talk about the future in such family time terms is common in popular climate change 
this course. One example is this quote from Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth. In the introduction to this book, he asks his readers to imagine themselves in the future talking to the children. And he writes, imagine now what they were asking. We were really, what were you we thinking? Didn't you care about the future? We were really so self-absorbed that we couldn't or wouldn't stop the destruction of Earth's environment. And my point is that this is the same rhetorical figure as Thunberg is, is using. Uh, let's move on to how Thunberg steps forward as a serial example. The way Thunberg uses the trope of the child corresponds with how it is used in popular climate change discourse, including political speeches. The trope is then most often used in plural as our children and grandchildren. And the possessive pronoun our implies a we or parents. The parent is widely used as a position of enunciation, for instance, by Emmanuel Macron in a speech to the US Congress in April 2018. In this speech, he argued for the importance of international climate agreements and stated, what is the meaning of our lives really if we work and live destroying the planet while sacrificing the future of our children? Macron draws on the same notion of a family time future as Thunberg. He leans on the long tradition of using family analogies for society to conceptualize society as an extended family. It's a way of making societal issues concrete. It is also a way of scaling up parental obligations to become political and even planetary concerns in the sense that taking care of the children implies taking care of the future in terms of the Earth system. Thunberg is creatively using this rhetoric and steps forward as an embodied exemplification of our children and grandchildren. Her gestures are made powerful in the interplay between the discursive practice of talk talking about our children and grandchildren and her bodily presence. Use examples or in text or speech is, according to literary scholar John Lyons, a way of gesturing outside the pure discourse of the speaker or writer towards support in a commonly accepted textual or referential world. And this also counts for how Macro uses the trope our children and grandchildren. He gestures towards the families of the audience. But when Thunberg steps forward as an embodied exemplification of our children and grandchildren, the dynamic between discourse and the referential world works the other way around. She's not gesturing out of, but into discourse. She is reality that, so to speak, breaks through into discourse. And this is the way she established her position of enunciation as a child. And then I move on to Thunberg as what I call a modeling example on how she uses this position of enunciation. I will bring in one last quote, this one, from her famous talk at the World Economic Forum in 2019, which ended this way. Adults keep saying we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I wanted to act as if our house is on fire because it is. I will emphasize her use of the fire metaphor. This is not just a metaphor for the current climate crisis. It also brings apocalyptic associations. And in that regard, it indicates an imagined time travel from a catastrophic future to the present. The 
metaphor is firmly related to the emotional terms she is using, fear, panic, and her rejection of, of hope. She pronounces fire and fear in a way that leaves no doubt that this is deeply felt. These words are pronounced in what literary scholar Isaac Winkelholm has called a prophetic tone, which he defines as, quote, the perception of the pre-catastrophic present effectively charged by the imagination of a post-catastrophic future, end quote. This tonality has three characteristics. First, it has a temporal, uh, circular temporal structure, a loop time structure. The fire metaphor is fueled by imagination of a post-catastrophic future, which is also expressed through her imagination of the, her 75th birthday from the quote I had from her TED talk. And second, it is effective. It contains affects that are partly evoked by the emerging disaster and partly by the imagination of the disaster in the future. And third, these affects are used to invoke the same kind of affective mode in the present to avoid this emerging disaster. So to conclude, uh, what I've tried to do is to argue that Thunberg gets her cultural energy from creatively new ways of using established rhetoric and from combining the serial and modeling aspect of its clarity. By connecting climate change to family time, she demonstrates that her future is just one among many. This seriality enables us to step forward and authorizes her position of enunciation as a child. While the modeling aspect of exemplarity is connected to her performative mode, in the intersection between tradition and innovation and between the representative and the exceptional, she has developed a language and a performative form that enables young people also to step forward and demonstrate the political and moral potential of being children. Thank you. Thank you. I must admit that you actually did it. You spoke about aesthetics, rhetorics, and politics in 15 minutes. Uh, and now we have time again for questions and comments. Um, and I think I would like to ask you one question, um, admitting that you did all these things. Uh, but you also spoke about performance and narrative or discourse. And I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on that. I mean, is there a distinction between performance on the one hand and narrative and discourse on the other? Or, well, I suppose you understand that I mean that there is not, that there is kind of a blending that the discourse and the, the narratives are performative or are performatives uh, in this context. Do you have anything, any ideas about that? Uh, well, I, I made the distinction just to, to clear out that there, there is a distinction between embodiment and and, and text, uh, the text could of course be performative or, or have a performative potential. But the, my point is, is to, to bring in also the aspect uh, of performativity that is more than text or uh, not just text. Uh, uh, that is uh, the way she performs her speeches and her bodily uh, presence. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Susan? Yes, thank you, Kira. And dare I say it, exemplary, as always. Um, 
Um, yeah, I actually had had two questions, and and one was very similar what what Anne brought up because I was thinking especially about this that you the discourse and performance, and I was thinking you could, I guess, there's always the the, the rhetoric, uh, rhetoric ex exemplarity, and sort of this behavior of uh, exemplarity or legislative exemplarity and executive exemplarity and, and sort of these levels. And I, I was wondering perhaps about the tension between these or if they, they might be sort of discrepancies there. And you, you can answer that if you want. But then then I had the second question with the with the Greta case and and uh because I mean she's also very much she's seen as a cultural hero but also very much as a as a threat by by many people as a threat, yes. Um, and, uh, and part of her being so dangerous is this child, childness aspect of, of her. But I mean, she won't remain a child for very many years to come, or will she? Uh, I, I was just wondering about this. Do, do, you, do you see what, how, how can she use that childness in, in a two years, one year? And how can that, so, yeah, it, it's a bit of a confused question, but it's all super interesting. Thank you. I think it's a, two very, very important questions. First of all, she's not the first one uh, that uses this trope in this way, that turns it the other way around. It has been done several times before, but she's the first one that really succeeds in doing that. And that... I guess has partly to do with with her uh, personality, her diagnosis, which she has talked about, her social network, and her um, her bodily presence. She actually looks like a child, even though she was fifteen and sixteen years old when when she held these speeches and her performances. I mean, uh, if you go back and listen to her speeches, uh, she improves a lot as a performer. Uh, and the way she uh, perform her, the way she uses her voice, the way she uses her, her um, um, theatrical ability is, is impressive and, and effective. But that wasn't what you were talking about. What, what, what you asked about was if she will be able to, to use this child trope um, uh, for years to come, and she will probably not be able to do that, and she will probably turn into something something else. Uh, and I think the COVID-19 situation is kind of a divide there because she... I mean, she traveled around the world, the Western world, at least, as a child until the COVID-19 uh, situation locked the world down. And when she will start to, 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 to make public appearances again and, and travel again, she will probably do it as something else, I, I guess. Um, but it would be interesting to go into that uh, transformation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Then Ina, Ina Kuhn. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation and for focusing on Greta and the very specific rhetoric around her, which I can very well tie in, um, yeah, re regarding my own field, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. But in my field, there's a very common and specifically, specifically kind expression that is in German, it would be Enkeltauglich future, which basically means a future suitable for grandchildren. There's a new adjective that is very much used. Yeah, it's one word in German and three in English, suitable for grandchildren. And also used by those who are not even in the age of have, to, to have children or nevertheless uh, grandchildren. But um, yeah, that's a common expression. And I keep wondering, depending on who uses it, how this is used as an extension of themselves or to distance themselves. I'm not sure. I feel like there's these two tendencies. 
those who see their children or grandchildren as an extension of themselves, and then those who seem to try to outsource the radical changes to a future generation that is not there yet. I mean, the grandchildren, that's, that's, there's some time to kill, right? And so they don't have to, have to like, have to can have mediocre changes within their lifetimes, but the radical changes, those are for the future generations, the grandchildren. So, yeah, I'm not sure that again, um, referring to Greta, if she provokes more sympathy or more feelings of distance for certain social groups or generations. Yeah, that's a comment and kind of a question. <laughs> Thank you. No, that was a great comment. Uh, I I'm, must admit that I read through abstracts several times and I look so much forward to a paper tomorrow. Um, I don't know what to answer. I think if that's a comment, I agree with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I really don't have an answer. Sorry. It seems a very good word, at least. Uh, do we have anything similar in the Nordic languages? We often copy German expressions. No, don't know. Can't think of any no? similar word. No. We'll look out for it, see if it pops up in the discourse in other countries as well. Uh, no more questions or comments to Kida? No. Then we'll go on. Thank you, Kida. Uh, we continue with the last uh, speaker and the last paper on today uh, by Ante Lindfors of the University of Helsinki, where he is an Academy of Finland postdoc. He's going to speak today about MISIC versus evidence-based exemplarity in the Wim Hof method. So please, Antti. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I'll try to share my screen here. I hope you can now see it. Uh, just need to get this full screen somehow here. Is it full screen now? Yes. So. My name is Antti Lindfors, I'm from the University of Helsinki, where I'm working <clears throat> as an Academy of Finland postdoctoral researcher. And um, my ongoing project relates to actually contemporary biohacking movement as, as an emerging mode of what I'm describing as techno-mediated naturalism. And amongst other things, I'm interested in how these novel communities within the therapeutic realm, such as biohackers, articulate their subjective self-experience with objective scientific knowledges, both sides like rationalizing each other. And my, my background is in folklore studies where I did my dissertation on stand-up comedy as a performance of self-presentation and an economy of relatability. So my current project is a slight departure from those concerns, but I think there are also continuities, for instance, is in this interplay between first person and third person forms of knowledge and self-fashioning and self-enhancement. Anyway, today I'm talking about a specific bodily practice, the Wim Hof method, and its relations with science and nature broadly, as well as Wim Hof himself as an exemplary figure in the therapeutic regime. So Wim Hof is a Dutchman with something like 30 Guinness world records, mostly having to do with enduring freezing cold temperatures or alternatively extremely hot temperatures or otherwise bodily <clears throat> like extremities and boundaries. And his personal life story is recounted in dozens of documents and social media artifacts with titles such as Becoming Superhuman with the Iceman or The Superhuman World of Wim Hof or Wim Hof the Iceman Cometh, which is the one we watched at a Wim Hof Method workshop that I attended March 2020 as part of my field work, just as the COVID-19 was about to land in Finland. And the Wim Hof Method is also something that I've encountered through this biohacking phenomenon on the one hand, where Wim Hof is a celebrity star, but also by practicing 
traditional Finnish ice swimming or winter swimming myself, and by becoming increasingly aware that this method is also gaining ground amongst Finnish ice swimmers. So the Wim Hof method, as designed and personified by the man himself, is a somatic technology of the self that is built around three pillars, which are first cold exposure, basically practiced in the form of ice swimming or or cold showers or whatever have you. On second, breathing practice, which is inspired by this Tibetan fire breathing that is basically controlled hyperventilation with et- extended breath holds. And third, mindfulness inspired mental practice with a twist related to sub-zero temperatures that can assist one in achieving this uh, non-evaluative self-present state. In other words, each of these pillars is a traditional existing cultural practice that the Wim Hof method has um, reappropriated and reintroduces for the contemporary therapeutic regime. He also makes this very clear himself that he's not inventing anything new, but merely using age-old techniques. Of course, cold, cold exposure, breathing technique, and mindfulness meditation are also very general bodily techniques that are being practiced in very diverse contexts of physical fitness and recovery, in moral and spiritual domains, or in trauma and stress-related recovery, meaning that they are generally regarded as functional methods also by the professionals. And the method lives on not only in actual practice, but also within various vernacular communities of social media, in Facebook where Facebook groups where it circulates as various audiovisual forms, but especially in YouTube where people of all ages film themselves and report in a self-experimental fashion how they've practiced the method for a certain period of time with such and such effects on their overall health or on very specific health issues, providing a sort of serial authentication for the method. Here's a screen capture from a recent Finnish example with an emblematic title, I tried eye swimming for 30 days, it changed my life. He actually references the the method as well. Uh, While eye swimming is conventionally held to relieve stress, bolster the immune system, improve sleep quality and so on, Wim Hof has taken such claims to the to the next level. He basically asserts that eye swimming can be used to teach anyone to access one's autonomic nervous system and thereby to influence one's immune and bodily function. A crucial factor in this regard in the fame and narrative of Wim Hof and his method relates to not only to his associations with the Guinness World Records, but to the fact that he has also subjected himself and his student groups under various clinical tests in support of his somewhat lofty rhetoric about manipulating the body. In an one noteworthy effort, Hoff and his group of trainees were injected with E. coli bacteria that would normally occasion an overreaction of the immune system with symptoms of fever and aches. However, his test group reported fewer signs of influenza and their measured blood values indicated far less inflammatory proteins than the control group and so on. So such contextualizations are then framed as scientific facts and incorporated as part of this increasingly dense intertextual web that surrounds Hoff. Uh, They are celebrated, for instance, as unequivocally demonstrating that the autonomic nervous system can be regulated contrary to the conventional wisdom of medical discourse. So this is the type of scientific hype that surrounds the method. Um, On the other hand, the method uh, can be seen as recirculating many of the central tropes of therapeutic cultural forms more generally, like this idea of activating and actualizing one's potential, of self-transcendence, of connecting with nature and oneself, as well as the uh, already mentioned privileged chronotope of here and now self-presence that is most iconically associated with mindfulness meditation. What I would like to here emphasize is also a sort of primitivist aesthetic of the Wim Hof method, manifested by what I would call an anti-cognitive bias, encapsulated in such phrases as, we live in our minds. Also, uh, modern primitivists often speak of this desensitization of the body in modern Western society. To quote a popular commentator of the method, journalist, anthropologist Scott Carney, 
modern Westerners are weakened in adaptive abilities, to quote, uh, with no challenge to overcome, frontier to press, a threat to flee from, humans of this millennium are overstuffed, overheated and understimulated. However, end of quote. However, the method also uh, combines this sort of anti-modern primitivist aesthetic of natural bodily capacity and adaptability with something that could be described as a pro-modern techno-optimism, exemplified by this ubiquitous neuro discourse that draws on hard scientific facts all the way down to genetics to activating the so-called longevity gene FOXO3. So, uh, so what I'll be speaking about <clears throat> relates to this tension between scientifically validated evidence-based exemplarity on the one hand and the more charismatic, bodily, affective, and could we say natural exemplarity on the other that I see as equally relevant here. Interestingly, by his own words, Wim Hof was first perceived as a freak of nature and he had to prove himself had to prove that everyone can learn this technique and do these extended ice exposures and that everyone's body is basically the same. And to do that, he needed science, basically. So he's both presented as a celebrity star of superhuman skills, that is, as a model to be emulated, if only we could emulate superhumans, but also by contrast, as, as a relatable everyman, that is, as a representative of the universal human. And of course, this is the basic tension between the two poles of exemplarity, as just nicely illustrated by Kyrre just a moment ago by drawing on Dorothy Noyes and Anna Eriksen, whom I'm also influenced by. And this basic tension grants the method with its most intriguing promise of all, which is what if there is a world of untapped potential in all of us just waiting to be released. So in what follows, I'll... I'll approach this tension by borrowing from semiotic anthropology the notion of typification, which is a close relative of exemplarity, I think, but not quite the same. And I argue that Wim Hof combines this scientific-driven, evidence-based exemplarity with a more natural and bodily form of exemplarity. And he does this by performing scientific demonstrations in the form of bodily spectacle. And what is more, we must furthermore follow his lead in a bodily and effective manner if we are to gain the benefits promised. So in a sense, he invites us to perform these quasi-scientific demonstrations and experiments on ourselves to prove ourselves of the functionality of his method and of our own bodies. So it's quite ingenious, isn't it? To briefly like um, <clears throat> conceptualize my take on exemplarity, I'd like to look at it as a form of social indexicality, meaning that exemplarity is a social phenomenon that emerges indexically in performances and enactments. It's something that is not often explicitly pointed out or underlined, but rather indexically inferred in uptake. This is just one perspective on the matter. So in this sense, exemplarity can be compared with more familiar notions of authority as well as expertise. I'm particularly reminded of how anthropologist E. Summers and Carr has described expertise as requiring ongoing enactment, often through memorable and convincing performance, and how Joel Kuipers has described authority as also being basically a communicative phenomenon. It's about speaking on behalf of something else or someone else. So exemplarity, I think, similarly involves a continual performance and also depends on a simultaneous meta-discursive regimentation that mediates between these performances and figures and gestures and the broader type that they are exemplifying. And then functional distinction between being a type of model or a warbild versus being a type of representative is thus also calibrated between the discursive and meta-discursive levels as well. <clears throat> Additionally, it seems to me that uh, while the representative exemplar is a token of a type, a broader type, uh, the model exemplar is a type itself that, that we can emulate. But this is something that I need to think further. So one approach to 
this issue of science mediation in the method is to look at it from the perspective of contextualization, familiar to folklorists and linguistic anthropologists alike, and to analyze how the method strategically recontextualizes and recirculates chosen textual fragments as scientific facts, or alternatively, how scientific facts themselves mutate as they cross genres of communication from the peer-reviewed neuroscientific article, for instance, to popular science books and manuals, all the way down to social media artifacts and other modes of social interaction where science is ultimately <coughs> recirculated and popularized. An obvious aspect here is rhetorical in the sense that science is rarely definitive, but under active negotiation. Here's an example from one of the studies that Wim Hof himself participated in, conducted by neuroscientists from Wayne State University, where they state as their conclusion that our results suggest the compelling possibility that the Wim Hof method might allow practitioners to develop higher level of control over key components of the autonomous system with implications for lifestyle interventions that might ameliorate multiple clinical syndromes. While Wim Hof himself tends to quote such uh, results by saying that the issue is now pretty much settled and he has been proven right by, by such studies. Anyway, rather than assessing Wim Hof's referencing technique, I'm more interested in what, the, what his case reveals more generally about our evidence-based economy and ideology of the natural and medical sciences, where scientific and especially medical facts circulate quite extensively as valuable and also quite contextually mutable textual commodities. As uh, Sundar Rajan has pointed out, basic scientific knowledge is being produced in an increasingly corporate environment and is ever more easily packaged and commodified as, for instance, databases and also various medical and therapeutic technologies. And her question is, what is a scientific fact and how does it operate as fact in a world that is increasingly markets oriented? These issues can be also addressed, I suggest, by looking at how the method relies on bodily spectacle, as I said, on <clears throat> corporeally demonstrating these capacities supposedly hidden in all of us, and by doing this as a form of scientific demonstration of sorts. An important factor here is that, that his Guinness World Record feats and other scientific tests that he has participated in tend to mix and blur together in, in a popular imaginary because his feats are quite similar in both domains. Of course, Guinness world records are not scientific tests. And uh, as medical anthropologist Joseph Dumit says, science also as a form of authoritative discourse has to be maintained and enacted in continual performance. And it also feeds on, science feeds on exemplarity and authority and expertise. And these performances of science are usually called scientific demonstrations, and scientific demonstrations are regarded as exemplifying and materializing scientific facts. However, when science is in this manner uh, materialized by the body of Wim Hof, for instance, and when the scientific demonstration is performed by embodying the scientific fact as a spectacle, science basically speaks to us in a very bodily and effective manner. And I suggest that what happens in such performances is that the scientific fact is powerfully iconized into a social type. What this means in semiotic anthropology is that such bodily performances do not only index scientific knowledge behind them, but in becoming like a ventriloquist for science, Wim Hof's bodily performance materially manifests science as a general fact and attach, attaches these facts onto certain character or figure himself. So Wim Hof basically aligns himself with evidence-based science and becomes evidence himself for this science and his method. I think there are res resonances here with what, with what Kyrre just talked about, Greta as well. Especially, I was struck by Kure's mention of Greta, like the di direction of exemplarity from the textual common world to the discourse and vice versa. Anyway, 
it's no it's no coincidence that both science and nature are the two agencies that are allowed to speak in the third person neutral voice they both gesture toward generalized capacities of human species so to look at how science is exemplified by ventriloquizing it through bodily spectacle and performance is one way to also get at how natural sciences are being naturalized in our society from a communicative perspective and there's also a dialectical relation between exemplifying scientific knowledge and the hegemonic status of these sciences and this is all all the more important to critically assess given the near monopoly on plausibility that biology and behaviorist sciences have acquired in the west today as as pointed out by william davies for instance so in this short account of exemplarity in the wim hof method i have endeavored to highlight some aspects of uh, typification involved in how the method is presented and how that affects its uptake and reception and as the project is still ongoing and i've yet to actually write anything on this specific topic i've only tried to show you some of the themes that i would hopefully address in the final paper and that being said i welcome all kinds of comments and questions that can possibly help me in in the process so thank you as a final ending note my first article on ice swimming was just released two weeks ago in science and society and it's the open access so if anyone's interested just look it up thank you Ante, for an extremely rich and interesting paper we look forward to further publications um anybody want to ask comment yeah julian um yes thank you very much um we haven't talked about gender yet in this in this panel and looking at these images of this wim hof in in the uh, in doing ice swimming and compared to greta with her iconic uh hairstyle i was wondering what also maybe is does it matter that greta is a is a girl and on the other hand is this ice swimming thing is it, is it the males uh, thing what is this also a way of enacting a, a, a certain ideal a very conservative ideal of masculinity the the, the, the tough guy so it, it remembers me it resonates with my field because this I, I do research among preppers and there's also this this idea of surviving anything becoming the the human being the, the male the tough guy who can just handle any situation cope with any difficulties and so on as there, there is this idea of the of the soldier the, the tough guy the fighter who can achieve anything so is this a male thing so this is my question and my comment thank you thank you for that yeah it's a great great question and uh well i could like approach it by saying that ice swimming traditionally in Finland it, it's it's been very it's the hobby of older women in Finland and like in recent decades it's uh <clears throat> it's becoming more and more popular amongst younger people and also amongst men and i think this whole biohacking or this science driven engineering ethos that is being introduced into this it, it's very it, it is as you said a masculine engineering ethos that is brought into these and that's how they appeal to broader like new segments of people men especially i think but um yeah there's a certain masculine like um this self transcendence element in the wim hof method but uh, but um yeah traditionally it's not not something that men have done in finland but uh, now now <laughs> Now the tides are turning. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then Kille, and uh, after him, my brother. Thank you, Antti. This this was extremely interesting paper, um, and I have one very very hard question, and that's not because I'm rude; it's because I'm really curious about this. Uh, uh, because you you. You uh, said that he became uh, 
an evidence or his performances and evidence of evidence evidence uh, based science and at the same time you you talks about him you talk about him in in terms of exemplarity and there is a relationship between evidence and examples uh, which i think is very very interesting to go into in this case but uh, it's i think it's hard to figure out how do you have any reflections upon that yeah it's a uh, well i'm glad you brought it up it's something that that i'm only beginning to like unravel myself like you're right that evidence is quite close to exemplarity as well but it's it's um it's not the same basically there's some something different in them but uh, yeah that, that would be a great way to try to unravel this this case i think because those two modes of representing himself representing like intersects and combine in this maybe my term evidence based exemplarity is a <laughs> is not the best one maybe i could just talk about evidence based uh the other side and the other side the natural side could be maybe approached as exemplarity but yes it's a it's a important distinction i agree Mm -hmm. Next is Pablo. Thank you, and um, thank you so much, um, Antti. I'm sort of biting my tongue. I don't know if I, if I should say this or not. But, that, but Julian's uh, remark uh, set my mind going in a sort of immediate way, because what happens if we figure get a twin bag as a little boy, and if we install the elderly women in the ice swimming uh, my first impression is that it it should be perfectly possible uh, and then then my thoughts stopped <laughs> so so i just leave it to you to to well pick it up or or, or forget it but i had a, i had a question for auntie uh, when it when i listened to ina louise and to kira it was it was very obvious to me in what direction the exemplars did point. And so actually, what, what's the point of it? What, what is the intention? What are they supposed to, to make people feel or think or strive for uh, or accept even? But, uh, I'm a little... I'm a little more I'm a little more curious about Wim Hof. If I stupidly asked you what is his method an example of, what would you answer me? What is his method an example of? I think it's an example of our universal bodily capacities and in adaptability adaptability mm -hmm. and in that he uh, it's it draws on science as well as this holistic natural ideology both of those and i think both of those are in equal measure part of the appeal and the rhetorical force of his his thing It's 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 uh, it's crystalline when 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 you say it. I I I felt it, but I couldn't say it as clear as you. Uh, and I agree that this mixture is is a peculiar one, and it's powerful. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, um, Julian, you want to comment? Yes, I have a, a another maybe a, a stupid question, but I was looking at those pictures thinking that must hurt, that must be painful. So my question is 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 there a are there is there a parallel or some resemblance between the the exemplarity a, a, a martyr stands for as the, the 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 martyr and his suffering the, the Christian uh, martyr and uh, and what 
Wim Hof and and similar guys in in extreme sports do. Is there a similar way they <laughs> like the, the the suffering of the body, which communicates a, a higher truth in some way? Is there is there any way of thinking around that, or is this a bad idea? I don't know. I was just well, wondering. I think it's a great it's a great idea. I think Mar martyrs, of course, are classic exemplars, and I think this suffering theme should be combined with the masculine theme. I think it's something that is has been studied in other fields, for instance, like mo film studies and mo media studies, the whole association between male suffering and, and that sort of thing. Well, it's a certainly a great point that I should think about more. Uh, I have no, like nothing more to say about that now, but I think the male suffering is, yeah, I should revisit some of those studies where male suffering is studied as a form of authenticating some, I don't know what it's, what it's used for. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, Susan. Yes, uh, thank you. Oh, fantastic paper also. I, um, I, I, going to pick up on, on Julian's comment because I, I seem to be indulging my, my inner me medievalist <laughs> in this session because I was also thinking very much about the saints and the, the miracle stories and, and the incredible endurance of the body. But I, I, I think there's a very clear parallel there in the sense that it's in this Wim Hof, it's this mind over matter, and in the saints it's this belief over matter. So there's certainly parallels in, in many levels. But I, I also had a question about this. Um, um, you, you showed these uh, videos of, of these followers of, of this method. So I was, I was wondering how much you've had time to look at this. Is there sort of a community or, or how, how does that aspect work? Is this this kind of really fanatic that you get in sense of certain followers of, of well, I don't know, anti vaccine or something that it's this kind of closed community or, or do you have any comments on this following of, of, of this method would be very interesting thank you yeah there are facebook groups where this method is being like discussed and especially youtube you can find dozens and dozens of videos where people it's it's typically this type of video where they self-experiment for a period of time i tried eye swimming for month or six months or something like that and then they report their progress and the results and the effects and yeah there are these should we say vernacular communities around this in many countries i'm i'm part of them in in finnish in the finnish context and uh, that's that's something that i maybe should study looking at those imitations more closely rather than the method itself so far i've participated in one Wim Hof method workshop in Finland. It's being practiced in these workshops and, and taught in these workshops that are just emerging in Finland as well. I think it's more popular in Sweden currently, but, but yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, I have a comment myself as well, or rather I'd like to pick up on this uh, gender issue uh, raised originally by Julian. Uh, because I think I think gender is more than and it, it belongs to the theoretical level of exemplarity, not merely the empirical. Um, and um, well I was struck by the same as several other who have spoken here about the intense masculinity uh, of the, the material that you presented. But I was also thinking when you answered, I think it was to Bible, uh, the question, what is this an example of? And you answered that it is an example of, oh, I don't remember, but something universal, universally human or something like that. Um, and then the question came up again in, in my head, would a female, a woman, could she be an example of the universal 
the universally human in the same way as a man could? Or would she just be an example of a woman? I mean, and, and that is actually a general theoretical question when it comes to uh, examples and exemplarity. Can women be examples of humanity? That was an abrupt question, but uh, <laughs> but anyhow, what do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great point as well. And um, maybe maybe if Wim Hof was a, maybe it was a woman who had this method and authenticated it through science, I think it could be it could be similarly effective but uh, you're right that it's, it's easier for men to present themselves as the universal of course yeah <clears throat> that is not to say that there are not many women participating in this method on the contrary i think it's quite popular also amongst women but i think it's more to do with how it tries to appeal to men by using this science-driven, techno-driven like discourse. But yeah, the gender issue is, as we've <laughs> here seen, it's it's something that I shouldn't I shouldn't like miss out on here. I should definitely include some discussion of gender in, in this this article, mm. especially. Mm. And perhaps consider whether it is on an empirical or an theoretical level that the issue enters. Mm -hmm. Hello. Mm, thank you. This is actually a question for you, Anna. Um, Kira, um, kindly um, saw to it that I got some reading before our session. So I, I, I read uh, the introduction to your book with Ellen Kefting. And I remember that you spoke about uh, exactly this question. Can a woman or could a woman in historical time be an example of for humanity, of a for humanity? And I guess that you your answer was no, or that it was extremely hard for a woman to, to sort of gain the scope of being a, a model for humanity. Uh, which brings me to the thought that if Wim Hof uh, sort of points into a utopian future, um, that utopia might embrace male and female, male and female individuals, but perhaps, and this, these are my prejudice, um, perhaps the science part of it does not appeal as much to women than to men. I feel very prejudiced to say it, but I, I would like to look that up um, empirically. Um, the swimmers, uh, how many take up the science part of it and how many stick to the swimming and are content with that. Yeah, and, and the book that, uh, that you referred to, my, my book or our book, it was largely historical, of course. And this, I mean, this relates to gender roles and social structures uh, and uh, a lot of things have been changing, not to something eternally female or, or, or male. So historically, I think it's quite obvious that women have not could be, uh, been able to be examples for humanity or of the human, uh, but merely as good or bad women. And of course, that may change, hopefully, has changed already. But it's still something about the words we use, the language, the power of the expressions that we use. I mean, Superman, Everyman, Humanity, and, and so on. There is very easily some kind of gender bias in the words and in the thinking about, um, well, about examples. Uh, about uh, models, ideals, uh, and so on. Uh, so I think perhaps it's just a point to be a bit careful about um, realizing that generalizing something often means gendering it as well and setting uh, males as the human and females as merely females. 
And if you then work with a theory about the relationship between the universal or exa examples uh, and particular and specific and concrete, you will very easily transpose that um, hierarchy between male and female into the theoretical uh, uh, level, simply because of the, the what's in the words, what's in, in the discourse. Mm 